this lecture, we're going to be talking about um, the different elements of the French Revolution and how it evolves over time. And so the French Revolution begins in 1789 uh, when the States General is called, uh, and the Third Estate kind of breaks away and forms their own institution known as the National Assembly. Um, the National Assembly represents the interests of the Third Estate, which is the largest uh, population-wise throughout the country. And so they immediately get the, the support of large numbers of uh, French working class people, French peasants, and the French middle class. Um, and so they're able to kind of exert influence relatively quickly. Um, an important event that kind of cements their influence and their power is something known as uh, the storming of the Bastille. And this happens in July of 1789. Um, and with that, the Bastille was an old prison uh, that had lots of uh, weapons stored in it. And so the, the and prisoners there as well. And so the, the third estate, members of the third estate mobs of people really from the cities as well storm the Bastille and they kind of take control of it. They take control of this ancient fortress uh, and they get uh, kind of uh, a few French soldiers are killed in, in the melee um, and they take control of the Bastille. Uh, and that becomes kind of like the, the marker for the beginning of the, this French Revolution. Much like in, um, in America, right, the, the first shots at Lexington and Concord are kind of known as the, the beginnings of the war even though there was political stuff happening beforehand, uh, that's the case here as well. This kind of movement um, of the National Assembly becomes very powerful then at this point, and they come to, to control a lot of things, right? And essentially what happens is the king, Louis XIV, is kind of forced to accept the National Assembly as a representative body and, and rely on them and, and listen to them and, and accept some of the reforms that they want to happen. So that's in 1789, and we reviewed some of this in the previous lecture. Um, right, they published this Declaration of Rights that all men should be able to have in, in the uh, country, and that happens about a month after the storming of the Bastille. They begin limiting the power of the church and confiscating some church land. Um, so that's the first organization. That assembly represented body lasts two years uh, until 1791, but during this time period, uh, there's still a lot of revolution, uh, revolutionary ideas happening, there's still a lot of tension and, and efforts to change, um, and essentially the legislative assembly decides you know, to try to limit some of the more radical things that were happening under the National Assembly and to limit some of the, the chaos that was happening in the country, some you know, fighting and things like that. And so in 1791, the legis a new body is formed called the Legislative Assembly, and they create a new constitution, so actually a written document. And this written document limits the power of the assembly, but also limits the power of the monarch. All right, they have the ability to create laws, which beforehand was that was left up to the, the will of the king, uh, and they also have the authority to declare war, which again is taking away um, powers the king used to have. And so we go back to the Enlightenment, really this is kind of an attempt to separate powers, right? We talked about Montesquieu and the separation of powers. His idea is a, a big factor in, in this revolution, right? And so the legislative assembly, assembly, their job is to make laws, and the king was described, his monarch's role in this was to um, enforce the laws, right? So we have this French Revolution, which will become much more radical at this time, is really not trying to completely change the system. It's not trying to get rid of the king, but trying to include the king in a new system that gives power um, and representation to more citizens in France. In France. Um, but within this assembly and within the Third Estate at large, there's division, right? So we said the Third Estate is the wealthy middle class the peasant class, the farmers, right, and the working class, the people working in factories and things like that in the cities and towns in France. And so each of those three groups within the Third Estate have very different interests and very different um, ideas. And so there's different factions that develop within the Legislative Assembly, within the Third Estate. You have the radicals, who were known as the Jacobin Party, so the Jacobins, and they were the most extreme because they wanted to get aw do away with, in its entirety, the French monarchy. There were mod moderates um, who might have been more supporters of the Legislative Assembly's efforts, right? They wanted some reforms, but they did not want to abolish the monarchy. Uh, they wanted to kind of keep things moderate, hence the name moderates. And then there was um, conservatives who wanted very little reform. They were kind of more closely aligned with um, the first and second estates. You know, they might have been more to them, even though they were part of the third estate. Um, and they supported a constitutional monarchy, right? They supported what the legis Legislative Assembly did, which was create a constitution that limited the power of the king. That's what they supported. Um, but oftentimes what happens in, in societies, we can kind of see this in our own country today, right? 
is that the extremes, the, the mi vocal minorities, really have the, the biggest say. They, they, they tend to wield a lot of influence because they, they, they yell the loudest, so to speak, right? And so the two extremes we have in French society at this time during the French Revolution in 1790, 1791, uh, you have the emigres, uh, who are the nobilities, who have, were exiled and who fled France when this all went down, once the, um, once the revolution happened. Uh, a lot of the peasants rose up and attacked their feudal lords, their, the nobles of their estates. Um, they, you know, destroyed some of the um, houses of, of the of the lords and stuff like that. So a lot of these nobles wanted to kind of, they left, they ex they were exiled, uh, but they wanted to undo the revolution. They wanted to restore the monarchy to its previous status, restore their own influence to its previous status. On the other extreme, you have the most extreme members of the Jacobin party, who were known as the sans culotte. Um, that is a French word meaning uh, without breaches, right? And breaches were kind of like the, um, were kind of the, the, the dress, the garb of the, the higher classes. And so they wore just a kind of regular pants, the, the sans culotte, the, the Parisian workers. And so they were seen as more ordinary uh, people. Uh, they were the mob, right? This was the mob of people in the cities, in Paris in particular. There's a lot of them. They were poor, they were angry, they were frustrated. And as a result, they wielded great influence. And they come to gain control of the Jacobin party. They gain, come to gain control of the party that will influence the French Revolution dramatically. Uh, while this is all going on internally, externally you have other monarchs in Europe, like Austria and Prussia, seeing what's happening in France. Right? You see the monarchy not being overthrown, but being limited and weakened dramatically. And their fear is that, well, if they're going, if this is happening in France, and we allow it to happen in France, it could also happen in our countries in Austria and Prussia and other other monarchs in, in Europe, Russia. And so the Legislative Assembly ends up declaring war in 1792 on Austria and Prussia uh, to kind of stop them from trying to influence and trying to help the nobles who are trying to come back. Um, and at first, the uh, war is not going well for the French. They you know, are in chaos. The, the military is weak because you have, it was used to be by the king. Now it's they're trying to control it. Um, and it's not looking good for the French. In, in the midst of this war with Austria and Prussia, uh, the radicals of saint culot begin rioting in France, in Paris. Uh, and it forces the Legislative Assembly to dissolve itself, to break apart. And in its place comes a new uh, re representative body known as the National Convention. And this is much more radical than, than the Legislative Assembly. This is formed in 1792. Uh, and the, one of their first acts is to abolish the monarchy. Uh, so the king now is no longer part of the system. And they declare France a republic, right? A, a representative republic where the people would vote and elect their leaders and, and representatives in the National Convention. Convention. So the Jacobin Club, these Jacobins become the radical political party. Uh, and Louis XVI loses his noble titles, and he's reduced just to an ordinary citizen. Uh, kind of seeing what's going on in the world, in his country, Louis XVI is very nervous. He's very uneasy with all the reforms happening. He's lost his power. Um, he doesn't know what's going to happen next. And so what he decides to do is he decides to kind of follow the path of the emigre, the other nobility, and he tries to flee France. He disguises himself, uh, him and his family, and he tries to leave. Unfortunately, he is caught. Unfortunately for him, he is caught. Someone spots him and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Uh, and when that happens, when they're escaping, the French, the, the, the extremists in France decide, this is, you know, we can't trust him anymore. He's trying to, you know, manipulate. He's trying to leave and, and create an army to come back, right? All these kind of crazy conspiracies develop. And so they behead him, right? So Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette are beheaded in a public square by the guillotine, which is a machine that kind of was seen as a more humane way to, to behead somebody because it was done in one quick swoop. Uh, and that happens in 1793. So really for the first uh, three or four years of this revolution, Louis XVI is still there and he's not you know, in any immediate danger until 1793 when he escape, tries to escape and is caught. And this is kind of seen in, in the rest of Europe, but in Austria and Prussia as a really extreme nerve wracking situation because if it happened there, it can happen anywhere. Right, and so now all the major powers are against France at this point if, uh, in attacking them. Um, the National Convention orders a draft. They conscript uh, forces, forced men into the army. Uh, and with this conscription, they manage to defend off the invasion and kind of keep their sovereignty, right? Prevent a takeover of the country. 
Uh, and this is now when we enter in 1793 at the end of this war and with the National Convention, we enter the most radical phase, the most extreme phase of this revolution in 1793. Uh, an element of the National Convention was an organization known as the Committee of Public Safety. And what they begin doing is they try to weed out any threats to the revolution, right? So anyone that they, they deem is a threat to the revolution, they begin to persecute. And this becomes known as the terror because it just snowballs, right? Uh, you say one wrong thing and suddenly you're an enemy of the, of the, the revolution um, and you can be put to death. This is led by a man named Maximilian Robespierre. He's kind of the leader of this um, radical committee. And he leads this essentially what's a witch hunt. He leads this witch hunt uh, attacking uh, anyone who supported, uh, who's suspected of supporting the monarchy. Um, so literally thousands of people in, throughout France are killed during this time, either because they were nobles or they allegedly supported the nobility. Um, and over time, um, even many of the original revolutionary leaders are deemed not radical enough anymore, uh, and they are also sentenced to death. This kind of eventually ends when people in the National Convention realize just how out of hand this is all getting. Uh, and so they decide that, in effect, the most radical people are the ones who are the most dangerous to the society. And so Robespierre himself is actually executed during this terror uh, in 1794, about a year after it begins. And he then, that kind of ends this most radical phase. It ends the terror with his death. So for about a year and a half or so, um, people are fearful of their lives. Thousands of people are killed throughout France because of it. They also make entirely new changes to French society, or at least they try to. They establish a new calendar that's not based on uh, Christianity at all, uh, but based on the start of the revolution. So the year 1789 is actually then the year one for them, because that's the first mark of this revolution. Um, they begin call, you know, transforming some churches into temples of reason. Um, they kind of prohibit a lot of open practices of faith in public. Um, and it's a really, they're trying to dramatically transform society and make it very secular, non-religious um, as well. Which, while many peasants and working class people were against the power of the bishops and cardinals, they still very much believed in their faith and, and, need, and expected to have access to the sacraments, right? And so get rid, getting, rid, getting rid of religion altogether was not what they wanted. They just didn't want the leaders of the church to be politically involved. Right, and so the consequences of this terror, uh, which develops in 1794, 1795, is that the National Convention decides that they don't want something like the terror happening again, and so they kind of disband themselves and they establish yet a new organization, a two-house legislature, right? So two bodies similar to the Congress in our country, right? House of Representatives and Senate, something along those lines in 1795. They also put a very strong executive branch. So whereas with the National Convention, they tried to pretty much abolish the executive branch by getting rid of the king, and they now restore that executive branch with something called the Directory. And the Directory was made up of five men um, who were seen as moderates, not radical sans culottes. Um, and these five men, this Directory decides to appoint a man named Napoleon Bonaparte to lead France's armies. And eventually, Napoleon himself will come to control uh, this Directory. But we'll get to that in the next lecture.